first topic is is discretization of a continuous time system, and the second is stability theory. All right. So for discretization, this is something that's very common. I already talked about why we need this uh, in practice. Because if you think about what we have learned, like the models we do, ordinary differential equations, Newton laws, right, is continuous time system. Mass times acceleration equals force. These are continuous time results. And when you implement any control law nowadays, it's going to through some discretization, either through a microcontroller, a program logic array PLC, or a more powerful like national instrument uh, equipment that some of you might have been exposed to. So all these are discrete time, discretized in the discrete time domain. So it's very common that we need to do this. We have a sampler which samples a continuous time function y of t into discrete time sampled. So if your continuous time y t looks like this, then your discrete time symptoms are valid only at this discrete instances. So uh, that's the discretization. Where while notations are y k, k is used specifically for discrete time signals, equals y continuous time, we use t. So it equals the signal of y at continuous time instance t of k. So defined by t times k. t is the sampling time. It's the interval between your two samplers. That's my notation. Now, this is only a discrete time sequence. In practice, right, when you, let's say you generate a controller, you have these discrete time control commands. Then what you do for feeding into the actual system, let's say you have a mass, you apply force to it. You have to, have to apply force continue, consistently throughout the time, right? You cannot just do impulses to a, for, to a mass. It has to be continuous time if you want to make it effective. So then we have this signal holding. Uh, most typically for us right now is zero order hold. It holds the signal at uh, in between the sampling instances. So if you are u zero here between zero and one, between zero and t, then you hold the value at u zero. So similarly, between t and two t, you hold the value at u of 1, or mathematically, uh, you can write it as this u of t, this continuous time signal with time index t, equals to the u of k, these discrete time instance values for the range when k is between two sampling instances, kt, k plus 1t. So. That's the <coughs> concept of zero order hold. Very <coughs> common, very easy. This is not the only signal hold. In practice, there are first order or higher order holds, but we won't be talking about those for this class. Now, let's talk about the most basic question. If you have a continuous time, you derived the continuous time model, let's say x dot equals ax plus bu. And in practice, when you control it, you need to do two things, right? You need to measure using some sensors. Let's say we can measure all the states. So we take measurements, and this measurement is discrete time. This is a sampler uh, over here. And the, the uh, information here can be used, let's say, for some control design. And then if you design the controller in continuous time, then you have to implement it in a discrete time domain. So you uh, sample the output from the continuous time controller and then put zero order hold before you feed the actual input to the system. So our goal is, because if you look at it, our controller, from our controller end, we are looking at the whole thing from here to, to here, right? So this whole thing is sort of like combined together. So when I, when I 
standing from the controller's perspective. So it's a fundamental question of what is the model if you know this? How is the relationship between the discrete time samples and then the discrete time output state variable? So that's our goal, to identify the model from here to here, given that this is uh, the continuous time model and this is a zero order hold. All right. The tools we use are exactly what we have learned in the previous lectures. I know how if I express the input here, u of t, I know exactly what my continuous time state output will be. Right? So if I know this one, based on the information here, I will be able to know how the sampled output looks like. So more specifically, this is what we do. We want to be able to know, like, uh, uh, this one in discrete time domain. We want to know, just to reiterate, how xtk plus 1, this is my next time instance of the state, will be related to my previous state value, my input information u. So this is our terminal result. If you take a look, this is the discrete time model that we're targeting at. We want to be able to know in state space how my state at time instance k plus 1 relates to k x at k and u at k. So this is the derivation that we're going to go through. All right. Let's start with taking a look at, uh, <coughs> we want to start from here, right? We want to start at time instance k. So let's take a look. Starting at time instance k, I know precisely how the output looks like. So I know like, at time k plus 1, xt of k plus 1 is going to be, this is using like the state solutions, right, for continuous time system. This is a continuous time system. And I know, let's say, I start at time tk, and then I look at what my output is at time tk plus 1. So I know this is the state transition matrix. So the power of uh, the indices here are ea, like my terminal time, tk plus 1, minus my starting time, tk, times my starting, uh, starting state condition, xt of k, then plus the integration from my starting point, tk, to my terminal point, tk plus 1. And then inside this ea, the terminal time minus integration tau, bu tau d tau. So just using the formula except that you treat this as my starting point. This is my terminal point. All right. We can simplify things a little bit, it turns out. I know what is the difference between my terminal time and my starting time. This is the sampling period, right? So this is the sampling period between my two sampling instances, let's say it's t, now over here, things can be simplified as well. The first thing to recognize is that between time tk and tk plus 1, what is my u tau? So let's draw some result here. Let's say my ut of k is something like this. And then after this zero order hold, we get the input to the system is going to become zero order hold and that these specific time instances this is u0 u1 u2 u3 etc between time instance tk and tk plus 1 let's say it's is in this range I know exactly what my u is. It's actually constant. So it equals to, for this case, if I look at t1 and t2, it equals u1. In the, in the general case, in 
between tk and tk plus 1, this is a constant u of tk from the zero order hold. So I can take this out immediately from the integral. So that's one significant simplification. And for the rest, this is looking like integration e a t k minus 1 minus tau b u tau. This can also be simplified by, I don't like having a lot of terms in the exponential function, so let us define this is eta, right? So I can express this, this integral instead of tau by using eta variable. If I do that, you see uh, this is e a eta, and then d of tau, because tau is, tau and eta have this relationship, right? So d tau equals negative d eta. So d eta is, neg is d negative tau, right? Uh, one more step towards the final goal. And then the integration starting at end point, you can see if tau starts at tk, then what is my value of eta? Eta is going to be when tau equals tk, it's going to be tk minus 1 minus tau minus tk. So it's tau at the bottom of this integral. And when tau equals tk plus 1, eta is 0. Right? So now this integral is completely about eta. <coughs> so there's a negative sign here, which is not very convenient. So we can take it out. d negative eta equals negative d eta. So this is integration t0 negative e a eta b d eta. So much easier. Now, if I integrate from t to 0, then it's the same as I integrate from 0 to t. Right? So negative integration from t to 0 is positive integration from 0 to t. So therefore, I can further get rid of this minus sign and get this final result. It doesn't matter now if I use, I can just use, this eta is just an intermediate variable that's going to be integrated out. So I can use back my tau notation without uh, causing any any changes to the final final result of the integral. As a sum up, we have thus derived the relationship between x at the discrete time domain, instance k plus 1, how it relates to xk and b and uk. So these coefficients, the discrete time a matrix ad is ea times tau times t, capital T, and then the discrete time B matrix is the integration, it's right here, from 0 to T, E, A, tau, B, U, tau. So that's the discrete time model. If you have a continuous time, state equation, and the zero order hold. Any questions? All right, so let's take a look at these results. So you see, Discrete time A, AD, relates to continuous time A matrix. Let's take a look at uh, some of the basic properties for these matrices. EAD, EAT, which is the discrete time A matrix. Let's take a look at the most fundamental property. What are the eigenvalues of this matrix, AD? So this is something that you know we have talked about. If you know the eigenvalue of A, then you can know the eigenvalue of EAT. Because we talked about EAT is T E lambda T T inverse, right? So we can do similarity transform for A, let's say is lambda, right? If there are distinct eigenvalues. If it's not distinct eigenvalues, we get a Jordan form. Jordan matrix, then it's JT. But the bottom line is what? Is that these matrices, E lambda T and E JT, their diagonal entries are, I'll get back to you, their diagonal matrix are, entries are E lambda T. So at the diagonal, the eigenvalue of this matrix is E lambda T. 
There's a question? Yeah, so by distinct eigenvalues, do you mean all, like if we're dealing with a three by three A matrix, do all three of them have to be distinct, or can two of them be distinct and one be, uh, or like can we have two repeating, one distinct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it can be, when I explicitly say distinct eigenvalues, I mean three, let's say three by three case, is, they are different. And then uh, if they are, there are repeated eigenvalues, we call uh, Jordan form. But yeah. Jordan form, right, still the main concept is diagonal are the eigenvalues, right? So that's the key point. Uh, just to wrap up, a similar similarity transformation applied to EAT is going to give you E lambda T. So these two matrices are similar. So they have the same eigenvalues. The eigenvalues of, therefore, the eigenvalues of the discrete time A matrix is nothing but E lambda T, where lambda is the eigenvalue of A. So that is the, some analysis, how the eigenvalues are mapped between continuous time and discrete time systems.